Well, that was uh, a wonderful talk by uh, Doc Chomsky and uh, Nochum. And thanks to uh, Roger Leisner, we got it on tape, and hopefully you... There's no one like Chomsky. That's why you hear him every night on uh, the McNeil Lair and News Hour as a guest, right? Only in America. Now, uh, in the time remaining, we're going to uh, have some graphics that sort of illustrate some things that or just for the hell of it. I took this uh, illustration from some British journal. Could we focus in on it? The, de the, the decapitated journalist? It's a, it's a tavern. And uh, this drawing was actually by someone named uh, Peter Pitar. And uh, I used it to illustrate another great moment in the history of journalism. Richard Salant, the president of CBS News, once said, our reporters do not cover stories from their point of view. They are presenting them from nobody's point of view. Last night I saw upon the news a little man who wasn't there. Tonight he wasn't there again. I wish he'd go away. Um, Chomsky mentioned... Uh, the war on drugs. This is from a great moment in the history of capitalism. Let's focus in on that. This is a wonderful illustration that appeared in a uh, a missionary book about uh, American missionaries in Ceylon. And uh, this is the stacking room in the great government opium factory at Patna. That's in India. Um, and the subhead says that uh, there was enough opium on the shelves shown in the photograph. This is obviously a, a steel engraving made from a photograph to put to death every man, woman, and child in Great Britain. Uh, uh, in the 1830s, starting in the 1830s, running for 30 years, uh, the British East India Company um, Decide, well, let me just read it to you. In the 1820s, British merchants were under pressure to expand trade with China to pay for its tea and silk. They imported vast amounts into England. The one readily available commodity the British had to offer was high-grade Bengalese opium, distributed through the East India Company. By guile, bribery, and violence, the drug habit was so successfully implanted in China that by the middle of the century, Opium was the largest single cash commodity in the world. The Chinese government's effort to stamp out the destructive, though highly profitable, trade erupted in a series of war minor wars with the West. I guess it wasn't minor to the people who died in it. Between 1830 and 1960, climaxed by the looting and burning of the Summer Palace. This was known as the Opium War. Hardly remembered today, by the victors, they are still vivid in the minds of China's present-day leaders. So this was actually not... See, this is the ancestor of the war against drugs, but it's actually... It wasn't the war against drugs. It was... Yes, folks. It was the war... for drugs. And Marx, uh, had some, and Marx used to write editorials, believe it or not, for the New York uh, Tribune. And he, this is what he said about this. While the semi-barbarian, and that was the emperor of China, stood on the principle of morality, the civilized opposed to him the principle of self, that a giant empire containing almost one-third of the human race, I think it was even then it was it had 300 million people, this sounds like a bad translation. Vegetating to the teeth of time. He wrote in German, by the way, and Engels translated it into English. 
uh, insulated by the forced exclusion of general intercourse and thus contriving to dupe itself with delusions of celestial perfection. She was called the Celestial Empire of the Chinese. That such an empire should at last be overtaken by fate on the occasion of a deadly duel in which the representative of the antiquated world appears prompted by ethical motives while the representative of overwhelming modern society, you see, uh, Marx was a scientist, you know, he was a social scientist. He had, he believed in, in that he was a, uh, that he was presenting scientific socialism as opposed to the utopian, when actually his system was as, about as utopian as you can get, because he believed in progress. Progress? Yeah, he believed that it was inevitable that uh, capitalism would evolve into uh, socialism. He believed that uh, socialism evolving into monopoly right now would would happen in his lifetime, and then when he died, Engels believed it would happen in his li lifetime, and when he died, no one believed it would happen in their lifetime. No, they did still believe, and we do still believe, especially since we're extending a people's lifetime. Anyway, not very scientific, but really wonderfully motivated. Anyway, he was a compassionate man in spite of being very strange in other ways. While the representative of overwhelming modern society, modern, that's it, fights for the privilege of buying in the cheapest and selling in the dearest markets. See, that sounds familiar. Buy cheap and sell dear. This indeed is the sort of tragical couplet, stranger than any poet would ever have dared to fancy. You know, Marx was a failed poet, too. He wanted to be a poet. He was a terrible poet, but uh, not a bad social scientist. There it is, folks, the stacking room in the great government opium factory at Patna. Northern India. It's marvelous, marvelous uh, graphic. Now, this could very well be uh, R.J. Reynolds today <laughs> because there's enough, they're willing to make enough. The nicotine wars. Yeah, they're willing to make enough uh, tobacco to kill uh, one out of five Americans every year. Because they give you the 400,000 figure a year, but they don't tell you that there are only 2 million deaths in America every year. So one out of five deaths is, uh, has an attribution of, uh, has the, the tobacco component. Yeah, but they're working on a handicap. Not everybody smokes. No, uh, they have to replace, uh, I, I get the uh, weekly morbidity and mortality report from the National Institutes of Health, and, and the latest one has the latest one has a, an ins, has a um, an article on uh, the uh, taking up of smoking by adolescents because the tobacco industry has to replace all its dead customers that it kills, and until recently the incidence of adults taking up smoking, I think the average, uh, the average person who smokes, smokes for 50 years. So it's a real investment that the industry has in these people. Uh, it was going down until 1888 or 1889. And uh, that's the same years when their uh, advertising budget went up from like a billion and a half to over three billion a year. That's how much they spent on advertising. And a lot of the the recent advertising has appealed to juveniles. Uh, Cam uh, Uncle Camel is, uh, what's his name? Joe Uncle Camel. Joe. Yeah. Old so what they're doing is recruiting, including the Village Voice, the guy who only, uh, who makes $5 million and has to make more money. 30 seconds? So uh, this can all be attributed to the increase in advertising. And Leonard Stern, uh, it's worth it. How much do you think you get for uh, you make for each uh, potential death, which ends in reality uh, decades later? And all you 